We Run From the Hunted by Darius John Granger I dab at the nick on my jaw with a towel and say, Ouch, do you always have to read to me when I'm shaving? Shaving, Harry Conjure scoffed. That's just it, shaving. Why can't you use a dilapidator like a normal person? What do you expect when you use an archaic razor? I happen to like the feel of a razor. Well, it's the same with a thirty thirty rifles, instead of blasters, Harry said, still riding me. The best the 21st century has to offer isn't good enough for you. Oh, no. He shoves the accumulation of unpaid bills in front of my face while I put the razor away and ask me, What do you expect to pay these with? 20th century coin of the realm? Okay, I say, lay off, so we happen to be a little behind in a few payments. A few payments? We haven't had a customer yet, Gil. Not even one single slightly jaded Earthman. No one. I still think Venus on the half shell is a good idea, I say stubbornly. Harry shook his head. Good for the bill collectors, good for the naive bearers who we've been feeding ever since we opened this joint. Good for the washed-up big-game hunter living off what little fat there is in our land, but not good for us. If we only had one customer, just one! Look out the window, I said, trying to be cheerful. Venus, raw, primitive, wild, 30 million miles from civilization, a hunter's paradise, and we're the guys who can serve Venus up to our customers on the half shell, hunting, nature watching, just loafing. They can name it. We've got it. You mean we've had it, Harry said gloomily, shaking the fistful of bills. Hey, Gil, it isn't only that. We haven't paid the bearers yet. Not that they are had to bear anything. We haven't even paid what's-his-name, the hunter. All he does is drink our whiskey. Why don't you admit it, Gil? Venus on the half shell is all washed up, and we might as well go back to Earth while we still have the fare. I grinned. Do we still have the fare? Well, if we sell some of your antique rifles... Sell them! I cried. But they're the only way to hunt, Harry. You know that. They're the only real way to hunt. It's no contest with a blaster. The local fauna don't stand a chance. If we just had one customer... A little while longer, Harry, I pleaded. You're right. All we need is one customer, just to spread the word. We've got a virgin paradise for hunters here, and I've heard that song before. Well, I said stubbornly, it's the truth. Just then someone knocked at the door. Harry and I shared a small cabin in the Venus on the half-shell stockade. It wasn't much of a cabin, and it doubled as an office and sleeping quarters. A knock on the door meant either the leader of the Venetians or Talbot Kramer, our has-been hunter who so far had been content to sit around drinking our whiskey. I opened the door. It was Talbot Kramer, complete with a week's worth of beard, red-rimmed eyes, moldy, swamp-smelling clothing, and a man-sized scowl. Natives are through, he said and laughed. It may have meant a lot to me and Harry, but it meant nothing to him. Through, I said. What the hell did they quit for? Wampa, Kramer said. Which? Harry asked him. Wampa, I repeated. I was excited. Don't you know what a wampa is? Not me, Harry said. Guess I was too busy studying unpaid bills. What's a wampa? I quit too, Talbot Kramer said suddenly. You can't expect a hunter to hang around when the bears have quit on you. Not anyways with a wampa around camp. Will someone please tell me, Harry begged, what a wampa is? I'll take the swamp buggy, Kramer said, getting ready to go outside. The hell you will, Harry and I both said together. Listen, you guys owe me some wages. I know you don't have the cash, but I'm not complaining. I'll take the swamp buggy. Hell, it's the only way out of here anyways. Some friend, Harry said. We won't have any way out ourselves. We'll be trapped in this damn swamp. Trapped, Kramer said incredulously. Did you say trapped? It's your place of business. There's all the food you need in the swamp. What's your hurry to leave? Besides, Mr. Gil Roberts here told me himself, one of these days you're going to get a lot of rich customers coming in with their own spaceships. Well, got to be going now. 
We went outside with him and over to the squat, ugly shape of the swamp buggy. The treads were a foot deep in mud, a normal state of affairs for the swamp buggy. It would run, though. It would take Talbot Kramer, ex-big game hunter with a reputation and not much else, back to an outpost of civilization and leave us without a guide if we ever got any customers. If you give us a little time, I said as Kramer climbed in the buggy through the roof hatch. Sorry, boys, he said, smelling of our liquor. There was a letter for me on this week's mail rocket. A job in Kenya. Kenya, Africa, Earth? I said as if I were addressing a letter. That's right, Kramer said, lowering himself through the hatch. In a moment, the swamp buggy shuddered and made growling noises and shook itself clear of the mud. Out of habit, Harry and I waved as the buggy churned across a hundred feet of thick mud and moved ponderously towards the stockade gate. We stood there and watched the buggy fade into the green, twilight swamps of Venus. It was very hot out there in the open, and Harry and I were drenched with sweat before the sound of the buggy's motor faded entirely. A hunter's paradise, Harry said. Aw, lay off, I told him. Nearby, the buggy suddenly roared again, its motor racing. Is he coming back? Harry asked hopefully. It wasn't the buggy, I said. Are you kidding? I'd know that motor anywhere. She needs a valve job like we need customers. That, I said without smiling, was the wampa. You're joking. I wish I was, I said, closing the gate. It sounded just like the swamp buggy. I know, probably looks like it too, for now. Are you nuts? Why do you think the natives ran away, and Kramer too? Wampa's deadly dangerous game. So stop smiling about it. I think it's funny, I said, being left alone like this. You know what wampa means in the Regan dialect? Harry said he did not. It means mimic. Oh, Harry said. He seemed relieved. You mean it can imitate sounds, like the swamp buggy's motor? Yeah, I said. It can imitate sounds and other things. It can look like a swamp buggy, or the video star Laura Lorette, or maybe Talbot Kramer, or even you. It's a mimic. What does it look like in real life? No one ever saw one in real life, only in real death. Very funny. No, I mean it, Harry. The wampa assumes its own shape when it's killed. If it's killed because that's rare, then it looks like a shapeless, jelly-like mass of protoplasma. Then what's so dangerous about it? It can mimic anything. A swamp buggy, a man, a blaster. A blaster? It can make like a blaster and blast the hell out of you, I said. It can make like a beautiful woman and then strangle you when you're at your weakest. It can... Did you lock the gate? Harry asked. I felt a little sorry for him. Maybe I'm no Frank Buck, but Harry wasn't cut out for the frontier at all. I told him I locked it. We went back to the cabin and had lunch out of cans. When we were working on a dessert of canned peaches, the spaceship came down. I beat Harry outside by three steps. The spaceship, a small sportster, sank on its knee tubes in the mud. It would be a devil of a job getting her airborne again, but we would worry about that later. I look at Harry. Harry looks at me. Customers? I say in a small voice. Harry said, I don't believe it. We stood with our backs to the Venus on the half-shell sign, running across the upper part of the cabin wall, and waited. After a little while, the small sportster's hat swung open. We squinted at it through, Venus's dazzling white sunless daylight and waited. A head popped out, big head with a mane of white hair, pink cheeks, and some loose extra chins, and a very strong jaw, and a small red flower of a mouth. Below the head was expensive sports clothing, very expensive, all suede and linen and the latest hunting styles you can see in the catalogs. He looked like a million bucks worth of something out of a spaceman's magazine. He snapped his fingers and said, Boy, our bags. Harry looked at me again. I looked at Harry. I placed the flat of my back against the small of his back and pushed. He went stumbling across the mud towards the sportster spaceship. When he got there, he managed to say, I'll take your bag, sir. I'll set up your tent, sir, I said. Tent, the man in the sports store repeated. 
Your classified ad in the Spacemans didn't say anything about a tent. That's Venus on the half shell, I said. Outdoor living. Venus is Venus is to the natives. But it's perfectly safe, sir. We have a stockade, as you can see. I don't know about a t any tent or roughing it, the sportsman boomed. Well, I said. Game running good, he asked. The best, I said. A blind man could bag the legal limit of rompas and quinos and junkets and ferzies in an afternoon. Better hope it takes longer than that, son, the sportsman moomed again. Didn't come all the way to Venus for an afternoon's walk in the wood. Walk in the woods, I said, nudging Harry, who had come back staggering under the weight of several suitcases. Walk in the woods. Yes, the spaceman said. What I mean is there's a man-sized hunting around here. Real man-sized, sir. Daughter's with me, he said, wet blanketing whatever sales pitch I might have had. Hope we haven't made a mistake. Could have gone on to Venus Joe's. I know Venus Joe's, but I like your ad in Spacemen. I always go by ads in Spacemen. Know why? No, I said, shaking my head. I'm Jason Woods Stevenson, he said, swinging his 200 pounds of hard sportsman muscle down the hatch and walking athletically across the swamp towards me. Jason Wood Stevenson, I said, then suddenly ran forward to pump his hand vigorously. Jason Wood Stevenson, if he liked it here at Venus on the Half Shell, Harry and I had made it, because Jason Wood Stevenson was the outdoor editor of Spaceman's Magazine, and the sportmen all over the solar system waited breathlessly each month for him to ponificate on some new out-of-the-way sportsman's paradise. If he passed on Venus on the half shell, we'd be swamped with business. Don't see any native trackers here, Jason W. Stevenson said after shaking my hand with a grip that almost broke the fingers. Have them outside? Well, the truth is, I said, is what? The trackers went back to their tribe. Went back? What about your hunters? Are you boys the hunters, too? I couldn't tell him about Talbot Kramer walking out on us. If I told him that, I knew he would climb right back into his sportster and head on to Venus Joe's. Venus Joe's, which had started with some fifty times the capital Harry and I had had, was doing well enough. But if Spaceman's Magazine gave them a plug and said nothing about us, we really were through. I knew it, and Harry, coming back from the tent platform, knew it and we didn't have to say it out loud. Yes, I told Mr. Stevenson. We're the guides, too. Experienced? We know Venus as well as anyone, I said, which wasn't exactly a lie, since no one, not even the extraterrestrial geographical survey, had been able to draw an accurate map of Venus yet. Mr. Stevenson seemed very doubtful. Well, boys, I don't know. No hard feelings, you understand. If I was alone, it might be different, but my daughter's here. She's not exactly a delicate item now, boys, but she's no big game hunter either. If it was a cabin instead of a tent, and if you had bearers and trackers, you can have our cabin, Harry cried desperately. Well, I don't know, boys. I gave Harry one of those desperate stares. Harry returned it to me, saying without words that he had no further ideas either. I could see our last chance, a favorable write-up in Spaceman's Magazine, going up in smoke. Mr. Stevenson started back towards his sportster and said, I'll say I stopped here on the way to Venus Joe's, boys. I'll say the place looked, ah, uh, primitive. How's that? Primitive, I'll say, for real outdoorsmen. Damning with faint praise, Harry whispered to me fiercely. Kill, you've got to do something. I nodded. My head was suddenly as empty of ideas as the space between galaxies is empty of stars. I followed Mr. Stevenson back to the sportster and watched him boost himself up towards the hatch athletically and lower his two hundred pounds in with the grace of a cat. When his head had disappeared, but before the latch banged shut, I said, Wampa! The head reappeared. What did you say, boy? I said, Wampa. Here, Wampa, here. Yes, sir, positively. I've never caught a wampa, Mr. Stevenson said. Only three men ever have. That's right, I said. 
If I could write it up for Spaceman's Magazine, assuming I catch one, we'd increase our circulations half a million copies. You'll catch one, I promised. Jason Wood Stevenson beamed at me. Oh, to hell with the Spacemans. I want to catch one because I never have. I've caught everything on Earth that the law lets you catch, boys. I was up at Venus's Joe's last year and took the legal limit of everything but Wampa. Never even saw Wampa, boys, he said. You've got yourself a customer. He came down again and strode quickly across the quadrangle towards the wood platform which would serve as the foundation of his tent, keeping it above the ozo and mud. He was whistling cheerfully, and he smiled again, the grin bisecting his face from ear to ear. If he had anything on his mind besides Wampa, it was Wampa skin. Whatever Wampa skin looked like. Aren't you forgetting something, sir? Harry asked. I don't think so, boys, am I? Harry nodded. Your daughter? he said. Mr. Stevenson's jaw dropped a foot. That girl, he cried. I almost forgot about her. He wasn't smiling now. If her mother ever learned I took her to a place like this, with absolutely no civilized conveniences. But with Wampa, I said. He sighed. Ginger, he called. You can come out now, Ginger, honey. Harry and I waited for Ginger to make her appearance. After a decent interval, she came gracefully out of the hatch. She was young and red-haired and pretty. She was built the way a girl ought to be built, and she had a million-dollar smile. The smile was for Harry Conjure. Right away she liked Harry. She was nice to me, but in a spoiled little rich girl way. But Harry was, as they say, her cup of tea. She went walking off with him towards the stockade to get her first lesson in Venetia fauna, while Mr. Stevenson and I pitched their tent. I was just as glad Ginger had decided Harry was for her, if either of us had had to be. I had too much to think about, such as Jason Wood Stevenson and Spaceman's Magazine, such as what a wampa could or would not be expected to do when hunted, such as our last chance to make good here on Venus. Let Harry have the love lice. I'll try to keep Venus on the half-shell solvent. That night, after supper, Mr. Stevenson and Ginger turned in early in preparation for our first sally the next day. Harry gasped and gazed and wandered about the stockade, moonstruck. Hey, snap out of it, I said. Lovely girl, he said. Lovely old man in charge of the outdoor section of Spaceman's Magazine, I said. Got a smile could melt the night side of Pluto. Wampa, I said, remember? You can handle it, Gil, old boy. I don't know if both of us, working together as hard as we've ever worked in our lives, can handle it. But we have to try. We have to be on our toes, Harry. Are you with me? Did you see how Ginger's whole face lights up when she smiles? Harry, I pleaded. We have a book inside. It isn't much, but it tells everything anybody knows about a wampa. What they do, how they kill people, how to trap them. If they can be captured. Harry, we're no hunters. Since Wampa is the solar system's most dangerous game, wouldn't you say that puts us at a slight disadvantage? Wouldn't you, Harry, old boy? She's really got a great sense of humor, too, Gil. For a rich kid, she's simple and unaffected, and let's go inside and look at the Wampa book. I'll be along in a little while, he waved at air. He wasn't looking at me. He wasn't thinking about Wampus or even Venus on the half shell. He was 6,000 parsecs away and still running. I sighed and went inside. I burned the midnight oil, learning what there was to learn about Wampus. In the morning, it was raining. Harry didn't seem to care. He had that moonstruck grin on his face, and I was sure the Stevenson's father and daughter noticed it. They were too polite to say anything about it, though, and Ginger Stevenson did seem friendlier towards Harry. Do we try it in the rain? Jason Wood Stevenson asked me. He wore a poncho which covered him, 33 rifle and all. It looked like a small tent with a head on top, but it was practical. Ginger wore a transparent raincoat which showed her nice sports clothes and nicer figure. It wasn't practical, but Ginger was a girl. Yes, sir, 
I said, we tried in the rain, and off we marched to find ourselves a wampa. We tried it in the rain, we tried it in the dazzling white Venusius daylight, we tried at dawn and we tried at dusk, we tried every way it said to try it in the book, but we didn't find any wampa. Twelve days went by that way, Mr. Stevenson had already told us his limit was fourteen days. I got glummer and glummer, but not Harry. If I asked Harry what a wampa was, he probably would have shrugged and said it wasn't important. Harry was still moonstruck, and the nicest part of it, from Harry's point of view, was this. Ginger was moonstruck, too. Mr. Stevenson, though, grew depressed. Not about Ginger and Harry. He didn't seem to mind. About the wampa. He wanted one. If you have ever known a sportsman after a particular game, you will understand. He had to get a wampa. I knew how he felt. We had to stay in business. No other animal would do, and although it wasn't our fault, I knew that if Mr. Stevenson didn't get himself a wampa, Venus on the half shell would not be saved by a big, many-paged spread in a spaceman's magazine. On the thirteenth day, Mr. Stevenson says, Going tomorrow, early in the morning. This is our last try, Gil. I know that, sir, I said. Before we start, thought I'd kick over the sportster's engine. Don't want last-minute trouble, you know. Yes, sir, I said. He climbed inside the small spaceship and kicked her over. He climbed down, satisfied. The rocket engine had purred like a kitten, and purred again outside the stockade. I jumped about a mile and came down feeling light as a feather. There couldn't be another sportster in the vicinity, certainly not. I knew it, and so did Mr. Stevenson, who had studied our little book about the wampa. Wampa, he said, looking at me. I nodded. We went for the rifles. Ginger had a short-barreled, light-kicking man lyncher. Harry and I carried Springfields, and Mr. Stevenson had a big Marley Magnum 375. We had enough firepower to stop anything the Venusia swamps offered, unless something, such as a wampa, stopped us first. Let's go out there, Mr. Stevenson said, loading a clip of ammo into the Marlins magazine and ramming a single shell into the breacher. I led the way, followed single file by Mr. Stevenson, Ginger, and Harry, in that order. We went less than a hundred yards and could no longer see the stockade behind us. Venusia Swamp Jungle was like that. It was strangely quiet, though. We noticed that at once. The usual small jungle noises were still, as if watching, waiting. The Wampa, I whispered. He's here, sir. How can you be sure? Listen. You mean the quiet? The animals know he's here. Instinctively, they fear him. They won't make a sound because if they do, he'll have them. He can mimic the sound of any life form, and when he does that, he has them. He has them how? Mr. Stevenson asked in a tight, anxious whisper. By pretending to be one of them and killing them when they don't expect it. I see, and we keep on the lookout, I said, and don't separate. As long as we stay together, sir, all four of us, we're safe. We had come a couple of hundred yards from the stockade. Unless you knew your way back, though, it could have been a couple hundred of miles. Some of the bogs could be treacherous, too. I went knee-deep in the muck and pulled my feet out. The mud made sucking sounds against the rubber of my boots. Something touched my shoulder and I whirled, but it was only Mr. Stevenson. Where are they? he asked. Ginger and Harry were gone. I swore. I called Harry every name in the book, but it didn't help. Hal, he had had ample time to be alone with Ginger, of all the fool stunts. You'd better find them, Roberts, and find them now, Mr. Stevenson said, his voice flat and cold. That's my little girl he has out there. I nodded grimly, and we went back along the trail, a slow step at a time, trying to pierce the green twilight gloom on either side. The jungle was very quiet. Deadly quiet. Wampa quiet. The animals told us soundlessly. The wampa was nearby. Harry, I called. Can you chance it? Mr. Stevenson whispered. I've got to. We went back slowly, at a crawl. We covered twenty yards, thirty. There was nothing. 
Harry, I called. Harry. Mr. Stevenson's hand gripped my shoulder. He pointed. What's that out there? I looked where he had pointed. Creepers? And thick fawn breaks obscured my view. I couldn't see a thing. Out there, he said again. I could see perhaps five yards, no more. It was utter silence. It was also hot and humid, as it always is in the Venetian swamps. My khakis clung to me with sweat. I still can't see a thing, I said. He pointed a third time. I stared and saw nothing, and was about to say so when something struck the side of my head just above the ear. I staggered off into the fern break and sat down. I was groggy and didn't know what had hit me. There still wasn't a sound in the jungle. When I brought my hand up to my ear and brought it away again, it was red and wet and glistening with blood. I turned around, slowly, stiffly. Jason Woods Stevenson stood there in the fern break. He looked gigantic. He lifted the big Marlin Magnum 375 over his head and brought it down, butt first. I rolled over and away. The big rifle struck half a foot from my head. Several inches of the rifle were buried in the mud, and I had time to stagger to my feet while Mr. Stevenson pulled it clear. What's the matter with you? I roared. What's the... He stood five feet from me. He swung the rifle around and pointed it at my chest. There wasn't a sound. Not a sound at all. It was like a nightmare. I used my own rifle to knock his aside as it went off. The Marlin Magnum packed a kick, and he stumbled back a step. I went after him, and when he pointed his rifle at me again and looked as if he would squeeze the chigger, I had no choice. I swung my own rifle like a club and brought it down with savage force on his shoulder. There was a sound, and the sound said his shoulder was broken. He merely scoffed and brought his rifle up again, broken shoulder and all, and then I knew. I shot him. I poured the whole clip into him, and the rifle kept kicking back against my shoulder, the stock slapping my cheek. I didn't want to think. It was not until the last bullet went thwomp home that he fell. It was the sound that only a hunter or a killer knows, the thwonk of lead into the flesh at close range. It is a horrible sound when what you're shooting at is a man, was a man, or looked like a man. Because as he fell, Jason Wood Stevenson changed. The features melted, becoming indistinct. The limbs fell in on themselves. The body grew big and round, bloated and somehow obscure. In seconds, what had been a man was a shapeless, quivering, dying mass of protoplasma. A wampa. Then Harry Conjure screamed. It was a scream of sudden awareness and fear. It was worse for Harry than it was for me. Harry was falling in love with Ginger, and now... I went crashing through the fern break, seeking them. I shouted at the top of my lungs now. Harry! Harry! I found them when it was almost too late. Harry was down on his back, a dazed look on his face. There was a smear of blood across his face from ear to mouth. There was a strange look in his eyes. Ginger Stevenson stood over him with a short barren man liquor. I shot six times with a new clip before she fell. Harry climbed to his feet and stormed at me, raging like a madman. You killed her, he cried. You! Then I made him turn around. He saw what was there, and what was there was not and had never been Ginger. He sobbed once, and I led him back to the stockade. But I don't get it, he said later. I had given him three stiff drinks, and they had helped some, but only a little. Harry needed time to think and time to forget. What happened to the Stevensons? To Ginger? There wasn't any Stevensons. No Ginger. Don't you remember? They came right after we heard the wampa make like a swamp buggy. Yeah, and when we got back, there was no spaceship in the stockade, right? Yeah, it was the Wampa all along. There never was a Mr. Stevenson or his daughter. But yeah, you're thinking the Wampa needs a model? I guess so. It probably had one. The Stevensons last year at Venus Joe's? Isn't that what it said as Mr. Stevenson? Harry agreed, 
but he didn't really care. He had fallen in love with a girl who didn't exist. Buck up, I said. It's all right for you to say. No, buck up, will you? What for? What the hell for? Because Venus on the half shelf has a chance now. Because we killed a wampa. It's only the fourth one ever, and we're going to get a lot of free publicity. Which ought to make this place. Yeah, that's true, Harry said. But his heart wasn't in it. We'll take pictures, I said. We'll write it up and send it into Spaceman's Magazine. And we'll have it made. Sportsmen will flock here for a crack at wampas. No, wait. I have a better idea. We'll take pictures and write it up, and we'll deliver our story in person to Spaceman's Magazine on Earth. Me? I just want to be alone, Gil. I don't feel like going anywhere. I smiled. Yes, you do. You'll deliver the pictures and the story in person to Spaceman's Outdoor Editor who the Wampa saw at Venus Joe's last year, to Jason Wood Stevenson. Yeah, Harry said, and maybe you'll get to meet his daughter, Ginger. Yeah, Harry said again, but this time he was smiling.